Good evening, and and welcome to welcome to Harvard Hillel and to and to Rozovsky Hall. Uh, I'm so I'm so glad to see the the crowd that is here for what I think is going to be a really wonderful and worthwhile conversation. Um, I've learned that since our special guest tonight, uh, Ari Shavit, was here last about two years ago with Jeff Goldberg in a conversation that some of you may recall. He has visited some 41 college uh, campuses uh, and, is, and is currently on a grand tour orchestrated by, uh, by Hillel International, and I'm so glad that we could be uh, a stop on that trip, but not just a stop because I understand from Arya that, that some special things began uh, last time you were in this last time you were in this space and maybe we'll hear a little bit about that as well uh, so I'm grateful to Jeremy Moskowitz who's here from Hillel International uh, and also to colleagues here to my colleague Miriam May to my colleague Rebecca Powell and to get to mention another one of my colleagues one of the things that strikes me as I look at who's here this evening is the number of people in this room I won't make you raise your hands but but I think I see the number of people in this room who either have been to Israel or are on the verge of going to this country that Ari speaks of with such a wonderful mixture of heartbreak and resilient refusal to despair, which I think is a very Israeli attribute. Um, I'm going to resist the impulse to introduce, um, and it's always a joy when we can put our students front and center because this is a student center and so what I'm going to do is invite Edith Klein uh, who is the undergraduate president of our undergraduate steering committee uh, to do the formal introductions. Welcome and I hope, I hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks, Jonah. Um, I think I know almost all of you, but my name is Edith Dixie, and I'm a junior at Harvard. I'm studying government in the Middle East, and I am president of the Undergraduate Steering Committee, which is basically our board here at Harvard Hillel. As hopefully you'll be able to get a little bit of a glimpse of tonight, Harvard Hillel is a very special place. It's warm, it's welcoming, it's exciting, and it often has a whole host of social and fun activities, which if you haven't been to yet, highly recommend. But I think it's also special in that it's a place where we try to foster dialogue and conversations and important, important conversations about issues that really mean a lot to us. And that can be everything from whether we should replace the rectangular tables downstairs with circular tables. I actually had that conversation a few years ago. It got rather heated. But also on topics that are a bit more near and dear to our hearts, such as Israel. And that's why today, we have with us, alongside our esteemed speaker that you all came to hear, two, two students whom, honestly, I'm really glad and touched to be able to call my friends because they're very special people. But they do have a little bit of a more formal introduction that I'm going to give you presently. Um, Aaron Grand is a sophomore studying economics with a secondary in history. He grew up in White Plains, New York, and is a graduate of the Solomon Schechter School. At Harvard, he's been involved in a few Jewish activities. He's uh, served on the student board of Hillel, is on the board of Me'or, involved in Chabad, and this is, I'm not embellishing, this is his bio, so if someone did embellish, it wouldn't be me. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> he is also an active leader in Alpha Epsilon Pi, the international Jewish fraternity, serves as president of Tamid here at Harvard, which promotes involvement by American students in Israeli businesses, is on the board of the Harvard Israel Initiative, and is vice president of the Israel Public Affairs Committee at Harvard, and is APEC campus liaison. And I'm pretty sure he goes to a few classes as well. <laughs> Rebecca Park is a senior from Jamaica Plain in Boston, Massachusetts, and is studying American history and literature. She is also a proud alum of Solomon Schechter, but though at Boston, as well as Camp Yavna. And here at Harvard, she's been involved in Israel on campus and has chaired the Harvard chapter of J Street U, which focuses on a two-state solution, ending the occupation, and urging American Jewish institutions to support these goals. She has also been active in various community dialogue conversations within Harvard Hillel, as well as, in, as well as is involved with the Student Conservative Minion and the Jewish Women's Group, which are smaller groups within Hillel. She's also president of the Radcliffe Pitches, which I'm probably most jealous about because not only can I not carry a tune, I can't uh, clap to a beat of one. But 
<laughs> With that being said, I'd like to give one final introduction to uh, Ari Shavit who is here with us this evening, and who I actually had the honor of hearing for the first time two years ago when I was a freshman and a little bit smaller than I am now, or felt that way at least. Ari Shavit is a leading Israeli columnist and writer. Born in Rehovot, Israel, Shavit served as a paratrooper in the IDF and studied philosophy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. In the 80s, he wrote for the progressive weekly Koterit Rashid, and in 1990, he was chairperson of the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. In 1995, he joined Haaretz, where he serves now on the editorial board. He is a leading commentator on Israeli public television as well. He is married, has a daughter and two sons, and lives in Kfar Shmar Yahu. Ari is here today as part of the Hillel International Campus Tour, as Jonah before me briefly mentioned, in which he has visited 40 different universities around the country in the last year and a half. He has spoken with, learned from, and debated thousands of students and faculty on this tour, which to me sounds exhausting, but probably gave him quite a range of experiences that he will be sharing with us today. And he is honored to be here today for his 41st campus visit and his second time speaking at Harvard. And I am honored for him to be here with us today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is really such an honor and privilege uh, to be here. As you understood, and I'll say a few things about this, uh, this room actually is quite meaningful for me because the event we had here two years ago following the pub publication of my book was very meaningful for me, and I'll soon say why. But I think that the fact uh, that we have here these two amazing young people representing two different Jewish organizations is so inspiring. Because one of the things that I've learned while traveling in this country and throughout the American Jewish community is how divided, how torn we are, what terrible phenomena of internal hate we have, how much people are after one another. So the fact that we have APAC and J Street here by my side, I think is a great sign that things can be perhaps a bit different. And I think that what I would love us to do today is really to have a different kind of conversation regarding Israel. I think that one of the deep problems we have, and we have so many problems, is the inability to have a civilized, intelligent, respectful debate regarding Israel. We don't have to agree. It's okay not to agree. But I think it is so important that each one of us will wrestle with the unconvenient truth. I think many people have insights. We should be listened to one another. And I think that if we'll all force ourselves to wrestle with the complexity, we will be better people and we will have a much better discussion. Perhaps, God willing, we'll actually discover that we can agree about more than we thought. So the main thing here is a conversation with, with Aaron and Rebecca and with all of you. But in order to launch it, I'll say a few words about myself, my country, and what I see as the challenges facing the Jewish people. When I wrote my book for five, six years, my main mission was not to promote some specific agenda. I'm a very opinionated Israeli. I know the solution to every Israeli problem. But my book was not about that. My book was an attempt to bring back the sense that Israel is a remarkable human endeavor. And what I did in writing the book is actually by going through the difficult parts, by addressing our flaws, our problems, our dark side, through that process I was actually able to see what the wonder Israel is. And in my mind, with all its problems, 
with all its flaws, Israel is a man-made miracle. Israel is a miracle because no other people did what we did to rebuild the national home after 2,000 years. Israel is a miracle because we built our home under the volcano and we managed to survive and thrive under the volcano. Don't take it for granted. It's an astonishing achievement. But Israel is also a miracle because it's a democracy. I'm very critical of the Israeli government. I don't think much about our political system. It's even worse than yours. But Israel is a free society. We had no reason to be a democracy. 95% of us came from countries that had no democratic tradition. We came to a region that totally rejects democracy. We ended up in a 100-year war. That's a recipe for a fascist country. Israel is not fascist. So the fact that we are an oasis of liberty, where we live, is quite remarkable, in my mind, quite wondrous. But Israel has so many problems, so many challenges, and it made so many mistakes. I wrestled it in the book, and I'm afraid that everything that has happened in the last two years has made things even worse. When I came here for the first time, many people asked me, am I not too pessimistic about the Israeli condition? After a few months, people stopped asking me that. But when I came to this country and I had this opportunity to travel here, I saw that not only Israel is a man-made miracle. In my mind, was what is achieved by the Jewish community in this country, specifically, especially over the last 100 years, is quite wondrous too. So many Jews are apologetic about, so to speak, Jewish power, Jewish organization. But I actually think that it's not only the remarkable success, personal success of so many Jews in this country that is impressive. What is impressive is the creation of this community that is totally based on voluntary values, that has brought so much to maintain Jewish life in this country and contributed so much to America. The fusion between the tradition of Jewish community life and the American democracy created something quite remarkable. And we should not be embarrassed about it. I think it should be an example to any other minority in this country and to any other minority throughout the world. But as I, as I came here to this room two years ago, I began seeing what is, in my mind, the greatest challenge facing the Jewish community here and Israel. And that is the terrible generation gap in the American Jewish community and in America at large. By and large, people over 70 have the Holocaust as their context and are religiously committed to Israel and Jewish life. By and large, people over 50 remember a young Israel, and they whine and grind, but they cannot help it. They're with Israel and Jewish life. But you people, the millennials, the ones sitting here, you are in a different world, as you know better than me. So the reason I went through to 40 campuses before coming here again, the reason I am obsessed with this issue, is that I feel that my generation, in Israel and in America, in many ways betrayed the young people. We've not provided the right kind of new, inspiring narrative that will enable younger people to feel what their parents and grandparents feel. So I hope that today we can discuss this with honesty, and I wish that we'll all share our real feelings because what I've seen in so many campuses, and I know that Harvard is much better than many other campuses I've been to, even in this city, even in the last few days. But in so many campuses, hearing thousands of students, I've heard so much agony. I saw so many people who are tormented. 
because they are torn between their love for Israel, their commitment to Jewish life, and the way Israel is perceived, and the way the Israeli government is behaving. And this is why I think the discussion we are having here is so important. So let me say, let me tell you as a beginning, how do I see this overall Israel issue? Let me, let me begin with the difficult. In my mind, the Israeli occupation of the West Bank is unacceptable. Unacceptable. And it's unacceptable because of two reasons. One, because it's unfair to our Palestinian neighbors. We have to share a land. They are left with 22% of the land. To try to take the 22% of the land that are left is unjust. To try to control another people is improper. But that's not the only issue. In my mind, occupation is being in loyal to the Zionist cause, and excuse me for the expression. I think that building settlements is endangering the Zionist project to which I'm so deeply committed. The whole point about Israel was to have one country where we will have an overwhelming Jewish majority so we can express ourselves politically as Jews within a, a democratic context in a legitimate way. That's what Israel is all about. If we want to have this home, this is what it is about. Trying to control the entire land, having nearly half of the population under Israeli rule, Palestinians, that endangers it all. It's not only unfair to the Palestinians, it's unfair to the Jewish people. Except for my beloved wife and my wonderful children, there is nothing more dear to me than the Jewish democratic state. I can be very emotional about it. When you think about our history, where we came from, what we went through, what we still face. The Jewish democratic state is such an endearing project. But if we have half the population under our rule, non-Jewish, there are only two options. If we give them political rights, it stops being Jewish. If we deny them political rights, it stops being democratic. I didn't study Middle East studies in school. I studied logic. There's no way to go around this basic problem. So in my mind, occupation is the worst silent killer that is endangering Israel today from within. And settlements are our worst historical mistake. Having said that, and I meant every word I said. Occupation and settlements have to be taken in context, something that many people have stopped doing. So the first layer of context is the fact that we did not wake one day and just grab the land. We were existentially threatened in 1967 when there was not one settlement and not one inch of occupied territory. We took over the West Bank and Gaza because our lives was, were at risk. The second layer of context is that we really tried to end occupation. In 1993, we opened our hearts under the leadership of Rabin and Paris. We trusted Yasser Arafat, and we really tried to end it. America finds it so difficult to come to terms with Fidel Castro, with the Castro regime. Only now you're doing it after so many years. Yasser Arafat was a hundred times more radioactive for us than the Castro regime. But we opened our hearts, we took a leap of faith. 
Five months after Yasser Arafat arrived in Gaza, the first bus exploded in Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv. We didn't give up. Six years later, Ehud Barak goes to Bill Clinton's peace summit in Camp David. I do not want to intervene in your politics like some Israelis do, so I will not say anything about Mrs. Clinton. But Mr. Clinton is probably the most capable individual to bring about peace in the Middle East. He has the EQ, the IQ, the compassion, the passion. Ehud Barak, with all its problems, was willing to give back the Gaza Strip, 95% of, of the West Bank, to divide Jerusalem. He broke every Israeli taboo. We would have been now celebrating the 15th year of the free Palestinian state. But the Palestinians rejected it, and the outcome was the worst terror offensive a democracy experience since World War II. I think that most Israelis are still post-traumatic because what they experienced when buses were exploding and cafes were exploding and nightclubs were exploding between 2000 and 2004. But we didn't give up. Came Ariel Sharon, the warmonger, the Israeli Milosevic, the extremist, the founder and the Caesar of settlements. And of all people, he dismantles every settlement in Gaza. We pull out of Gaza, not one settlement remains, not one checkpoint. Is the outcome a Palestinian Singapore? The outcome is a Hamas-controlled territory which oppresses gays, women, Christians, individuals, has a semi-fascist regime, and attacks Israel every few months. That does not mean we have to give up, but that's the context. The third layer of context is what's going on around us. I'm not willing to compare Israel for a moment to Bashar al-Assad or ISIS or any of either, anyone else of our despotic neighbors. But we have to look at what's going around. As much as I oppose settlements, are settlements the major issue right now, the human, major human rights violation in the Middle East? Is this the source of human suffering in this region? We have an entire region spiraling out of control. Only in Tunisia there is some sort of hope. Young people your age, Arabs, that I care about. I'm an Israeli, but I care about my Arab neighbors. What political hope do they have? It's either a military dictatorship, a reactionary monarchy, an Islamic theocracy, or bloody chaos. So we live in this region that is like a disaster zone. Quarter of a million people dead in Syria. 11 million people lost their homes in the last few years. The world totally incompetent in dealing with this. This is the context. This is where we live. As I said this morning to some people, Tel Aviv is like an Amsterdam next to Damascus. Israel is like Southern California, surrounded by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and you name it. We are faced with the challenge of trying to be a democracy, to trying to have, be a kind of little America in this brutal region that is so cruel to all its residents. But then there is the fourth layer of context. And the fourth layer of context is the Jewish saga. I think that one of the problems we have is that so many people here on the extreme right and on the extreme left have forgotten that we are fundamentally a minority. Jews have been so successful. We make so much noise that people forget what our, our real size is, what's our history, and what is the challenges we face. So let me say this, and I know it's a daring statement. Fundamentally, fundamentally, the Jewish people and the Jewish democratic state are a David. We are a David because of the three great monotheistic religions. One has over two billion people, one has over one and a half billion people, and the third one, ours, has 14.2 million people on a good day. Again, we are perceived as a giant, we are a midget. We are a demographic midget. 
But it's not only that. For so many years, we were hoping that the old hate regarding the Jews has subsided. The Holocaust, in a tragic way, was a kind of chemotherapy to this old ancient cancer. But what we see today throughout Europe, and sadly I see signs of it here and there even in this country, is that old hate is gradually coming back. We had 50, 60 years that were the golden era where it was really easy to be Jewish. I'm, in many parts of the world, it's not true anymore, and I hope that America will remain the way it is, but we do not know where it is. There are people who have a complicated relationship with the Jewish people for different reasons. The third element of this, David, is the fact that Israel is fundamentally endangered. So occupation is unacceptable, but intimidation is unacceptable too. There are many issues in America. We have many problems, but there isn't one person in this room that has doubt whether America will be here in 20 years' time or 50 years' time. No Israeli is certain of what the future holds. My 11-year-old boy and my 7-year-old boy are just like American kids. They wear the same clothes, they disappear in the same iPads, they listen to the same music. But there is something hovering above them that is different than American kids. And we have to acknowledge that. While we deal with occupation, we have to remember that element. The problem is that this David, this David went crazy. We began to behave and think and feel like a Goliath. So it's occupation, it's settlement, it's some of the brutal policies and the wrong kind of rhetorics that we've adopted. But on the other hand, we also have this obsession with singling out Israel and dealing with Israel as if it's the vicious power, not understanding the complexity of our existence not understanding the fundamental justice of our, of, our, of our existence. I've been to so many campuses, I did not see an anti-China movement anywhere. I did not see an active free Tibet movement. I don't even see real, real strong emotions about all the other atrocities happening. Why is this obsession? Where does it come from? And now this attack on Israel's right to exist, we are colonialists. We are colonialists. We were white Christian Europe's ultimate other for 1,500 years. Then we became white Christian Europe's ultimate victim. We went to our ancient homeland because we had to run for our lives because the real power in the world was about to murder us. We were not sent there by some empire. I love Australia. It's a wonderful democracy. It combines, it's a kind of British California. But if Australia is legitimate, Israel is definitely legitimate. Because they had no existential need to go to that remote continent. And they did not go back to their ancient homeland. And in Australia, 90, 95%, 5% of the indigenous population disappeared. Something did not happen with us. So why is it? Why is it there is such an obsession with hating us in such a way? To end this... I would say the following. The real challenge as I see it, but I will want to hear you about it, is to remind ourselves and remind others that we are a David and to change our ways in a way that it is clear that it is so. On the one hand, we must do everything possible to end occupation. We must stop settlement activity at once on the other hand, 
We have to rebuild our own narrative. We have to bring back a moral dimension to our political life in Israel. We have to be inspirational. It is unacceptable in my mind that Israel will be for so many young American Jews a kind of embarrassing relative. So the need to do, we must do two things at once. On the one hand, to do our best to fix Israel, we can discuss how this can be done. But on the other hand, to remember the context. And if I dare say so, to find a way to love ourselves again. On the one hand, we have a mission to change. We have a mission to be better. We have a mission to deal with all the flaws and problems. But on the other hand, we must see the greatness, not only of the great ancient Jewish past, but the incredible achievement of the Jewish people in the last century, and specifically in the last 70 years. We must be proud of it, we must cherish it, and with this sense of identity and pride, we must deal with our flaws, so we are indeed a David again. Thank you very much. So I think the idea is that there'll be some time for uh, Aaron and I to get to ask Ari some questions, and then he'll get to ask us some questions. Do you, when you'd like to start with? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a question. I would just respond, like, like my opinion. I mean, I, I totally agree with, with what you have to say about uh, basically everything. I mean, um, <laughs> but... I mean, we, I would, we can leave it to that. That's I would just say, if you're hearing, if we're asking student perspectives, I'd say that the only thing that, like, just my perspective that's different is, I mean, I think there's a lot of fixation on the settlements, you know, and, and I, not, I don't necessarily agree with the presence of Israel in the West Bank, and personally, I think there, I believe in a two-state solution. I would just question that, you know, you mentioned Ariel Sharon pulling out of Gaza in 2005, um, and I would, I would, venture that a similar venture is is just as possible. I mean, if Sharon could do it, I don't know if Bibi is the person to do it, but it sets the model of somebody who's right wing and who comes from a hawk-like background of doing it. And I mean, even in, you know, in, in um, Omert and, and um, um, I just blank, on, uh, in 2000, um, what, did, what was the prime minister in 2000? Barack. In Barack, sorry. In Barack's plan. Even in those plans, I mean, you saw the major settlement blocks remaining as part of Israel with land swaps. So I, would, so I don't necessarily agree with a, a few people going onto hilltops and claiming them for Israel in the middle of Palestinian land. I think that's wrong. But, but my opinion is, in the end of the day, just as Sharon did it in Gaza, these these few people that are in really extraneous parts of the West Bank could be pulled back. Um, and this major settlement blocks, which I think is, there's a lot of complaining over, um, would, would remain part of Israel as has essentially always been agreed. So can, can you crystallize the question there? Oh I, was, oh, I thought I was like trying to be part of a panel uh -huh. and like uh -huh. giving my question. Um, I mean, uh -huh. I guess, how, w how would you respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but also, I mean, my general question is something, you know, you didn't as much touch on, but you went to 41 campuses, and I mean, to what extent do you see opinions like that, other opinions that are pro-Israel, opinions that are anti-Israel, and I'm curious what insight you can offer on that subject, because we're at one campus, and our campus has a character of its own, but it's very unlike that of other campuses. So I'll, I'll respond to that, and then... then We'll have ours, and then so so the two, of course, two different issues, and and each one very important uh, in itself. So let's begin with the first one. I really look on the one hand. I think we have to understand that you know this conflict is so deep, it's so tragic. It won't just disappear, and and probably we have to live with not only complexity but a situation that doesn't have a clear solution. 
In a sense, the, the Zionist movement and the establishment of Israel it created a situation that has no solution, no clear fix. And, and, and I think that one of the mistakes we did in the past, that we had the messianic right-wing approach, the greater Israel dream, but then sadly, even my people, the peaceniks, have become messianic, and they had a kind of greater peace idea that was, in my mind, much more moral and inspiring, but not realistic. So, in a sense, what the short history of Israel regarding this issue is we tried everything. We tried occupation, doesn't work. We tried peace, doesn't work. We tried unilateralism, doesn't work. So what do we do? And my approach is that we have to revise our thinking. I think we need creative thinking because we have to understand and, and to admit that everything failed. And it's not that if, if Barak would have been a bit more polite in Camp David or El Olmert would have given another half percent of the West Bank, we would, it would have been sold. Ridiculous. We tried it so the old paradigm was wonderful. It's not applicable, definitely not in the new circumstances which we have. The successful peace processes we had in the past were with strong Arab tyrants, benevolent tyrants, Sadat and Hussein. Today, there isn't one moderate Arab leader that has enough legitimacy, in my mind, to sign a new peace agreement. Many of these moderate Arabs are closer to Israel than they ever were, but you cannot see them again in the White House lawn shaking the hand of the Israeli Prime Minister, even if it will be Zahava Galon. So, so we, we, I think we have, we have to wrestle with that, with that complexity. In, 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 a, in a short, in a, in, a, in a brief way, I will say, the Israeli left and the international community were totally right about occupation and settlement, but we, I dare say we, were wrong in promising a peace that was not quite there. So I think that if we bring the new kind of concept, we can deal with this issue. And, and roughly, I, again, I'm, I'm willing to elaborate later, my general idea is to try a kind of de facto peace. I think that we have to try to have an alliance, an American-Arab-Israeli alliance that will not be about peace, but will be about stability in the Middle East. If we'll try to fight or to deal with the Iranian threat, with ISIS, with radical forces together, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, the Gulf countries, Israel, under American leadership, if we'll have all kinds of economic projects that will create interdependency, gas pipes, water projects, take Israeli technology and Israeli resources, use them in order to have more prosperity and interdependence, and within that context to deal with the Palestinian issue. And I think the way forward is to begin with a settlement freeze in the West Bank, outside the blocks. I think that the mistake done in 2009 was that there was an attempt to have an overall settlement freeze. That won't work. We need a permanent settlement freeze beyond the blocks in the West Bank. We need a Marshall Plan to rebuild Gaza. We need to take Saudi money to fund Israel's amazing water technology so we will have water projects in Gaza so they will have drinking water. We need to use the Israeli gas to give them for free gas so they have, they have energy for their power stations. We need housing projects there. And then gradually work with the Salam Fayyad part of Palestinian society, that is the constructive part, in order to build a two-state state. I'd say endorse the two-state vision, launch two-state dynamics, and create a two-state state, even if there is no two-state solution tomorrow. The one flaw with the two-state solution concept was the word solution, because the solution is not there. But there is no alternative for the two-state way. So that's my thing about it. And then if we learn, if you understand, occupation cannot work. Peace as we hoped for and we, we dreamt of will not happen soon. And unilateralism in the simplistic way doesn't work either. I think we can have this more complex and nuanced and creative idea that I think can give some reasonable kind of hope. Now, touching on the other subject, which, you know, this one is very important, but the, the issue of, of, of young American Jews, and, and not Jews, is, is, is so much in my heart. You people here are really lucky, and I hope you are aware of it. 
not only because you're in the best university, because things are not so poisonous here. But I was in so many campuses where the pain of people who care about Israel is so deep. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I've learned. We basically have three problems. One is the one that everybody talks about, BDS. BDS, in my mind, is a, a vicious organization or movement. I think it's, it's not about peace and justice, but about promoting hate. Sometimes it has even anti-Semitic elements to it. But in my mind, it's not the worst problem or not the main challenge facing Jews in America. Because what BDS is still a small organization, it's growing, it's dangerous, but it uses, it manipulates the weakness of Jewish life in this country. Because the major problem that I see, and I want to hear you people soon, is the tension the tension between the progressive identity of 85, 90% of young American Jews and young Americans and Israel. This tension that Israel is perceived as part of the conservative agenda, that Israel seems to be on the other side of the track. People who care so much about human rights, but they cannot understand Israel's record of human rights. People care so much about social justice, and then what do you do with it? The failure in providing a relevant narrative, the failure in acting in a way that will inspire people. I didn't only speak to thousands or probably tens of thousands of students. I tried to listen. I listened personally to thousands of students. And I've heard so many people who are suffering personally because of this. So many people that are torn in a personal way. So on the one hand, in some campuses, people face real new anti-Semitism. You cannot hide it. People feel that they are hated. People are fearful. There is a kind of totalitarian spirit out there regarding Israel. People went on birthright are ashamed to say that they went on birthright. People sometimes cannot wear their Jewish, I'm not talking about IDF t-shirts, about any Jewish t-shirt. There is a real problem on the one hand. On the other hand, they cannot relate to Netanyahu's Israel. They cannot identify with Naftali Bennett's Israel. So I think that really, the, I, I ask the Jewish leaders in Israel and in these countries to wake up, to wake up. As I said, I think my generation betrayed your generation. We did not provide the reality, and we do not provide the narrative, and we do not provide the vocabulary that allows us to make Israel relevant and inspiring in the 21st century. So the need to redefine what I think is a kind of progressive Zionism that will be relevant. First of all, I, th I believe in it. I think it's the right thing. It's where we, should, where we belong. But there is a kind of strategic need for that. Because right now, that's the major problem that I see in so many campuses. And, and, and this, is, you know, this is my concern. This is, you know, my, my, my pain is there, seeing this agony throughout. And this is where I think we have to do our best to, to, to change the way things are. Um, so you said that one of the most urgent things that needs to happen is an end to settlements, a settlement freeze, and an end to the occupation. And you also just said that American Jewish leaders need to wake up. Um, so I guess my question is, what is the responsibility and the capability of American Jewish students to end the occupation? Um, and what is the same for American Jewish institutional leaders? Uh, I think, and I think I said it to you in an earlier conversation today, that there, it's, the irony is for people like yourself, uh, there are two fronts to fight, as I just said. Now, usually in life, you don't want two fronts. It makes you weaker. But I think that on, these issue, on this issue, actually fighting in two fronts is actually makes us, can make young people strong. Because I think on the one hand, if those people who are committed to human rights, to peace, to social justice, will be at the forefront 
of the fight for Israel, to fight the demonization of Israel, to fight BDS, these people are the most effective in doing so. But at the same time, there is another front, which is to put pressure on Israel and to put pressure on the Jewish world to change Israel. So I think I don't want you to be cautious about Israel. Don't, don't be too polite. Israelis are not too polite. You should not be too, too polite. You have a stake in Israel. Israel has an impact on your life, on your future. So if Israel does things that are wrong, that you find troubling, don't give up on it. Don't alienate yourself. Don't be involved. I think that if we simultaneously, young people will be fighting for Israel on campuses, but will fight, will we'll try to transform Israel and express their concerns in a, in a loud and clear way, these two fronts will actually strengthen each other. The fight in defense of Israel will be strengthened by the fight to transform Israel. And I think that we, 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 if we understand that we need Israel, but we must fix Israel, that's the right kind of combination. And what do you think American Jewish institutional leaders can do? The same thing. Or? Yeah, it's, it's, and that's, I, I, I don't want inter, inner Jewish isolationism. I, I want, first of all, I'm very critical of many of my fellow Israelis who do not understand the American Jewish community or diaspora Jewry. They're not enough interested. They don't know what the problems are. You now, some people live in a kind of closed world. They just expect to get the support. But I think part of the change we need is really to understand that there are these two modes of Jewish existence, the sovereignty mode and the diaspora mode. Or, as I said, the two miracles of sovereignty in Israel and the perfect diaspora here. Both are, in my mind, marvelous, not only legitimate, but wonderful. Both are endangered, and both are interdependent. So I don't expect you people to make aliyah. Anyone wants to come, welcome. But I think that actually Zionism in the 21st century means trying to strengthen Jewish communities throughout the world. So we cannot do things that are actually making life more difficult for you here. And I'll, I'll just make one point here. You know, anyone who decides to opt out of Jewish people has a right to do that. In our world, I cannot impose the Jewish identity on anyone, and I don't wish to impose anything on anyone. But I want us all to understand that if you care about your Jewish identity, you cannot give up on Israel. Because the irony is that actually Israel is essential for non-ultra-Orthodox Jews. Ultra-Orthodox Jews will be okay in the diaspora as well. They can live in communities in, in Antwerp, in, in, in Brooklyn, in Manchester, wherever. The future of non-ultra-Orthodox Jewish civilization is challenged. And the brilliant idea about having Israel was not only to save us from the anti-Semites, it was to create a place that will be a powerhouse for a modern, relevant Jewish identity. It doesn't mean that you have to go there, but there is a need for have, to having that place. Otherwise, it'll be very difficult to sustain successful Jewish communities here in the 22nd century. So you have anyone who cares. Again, anyone who decides that it doesn't, is not into the Jewish thing, fine. But if you're into the Jewish thing, there is no option of ignoring Israel. I want you to understand it. I want Israel to understand it. Because what happened in Israel, that Israel was overtaken, or the political system, by ultra-nationalists who are endangering the Jewish people, and ultra-religious people who are endangering the Jewish religion. We cannot drive away reformed Jews and conservative Jews. We cannot drive away young people. And right now, Israel is behaving in a way that is irresponsible, not only regarding the settlements and occupation, but regarding your community. So I think that the new mode will be, again, to see these two pillars of Jewish existence. Sadly, today it's all, it depends on America and Israel. 84% of Jews live either in here or in Israel. This is where the future, future, Jewish future will be decided. So let's respect both modes of existence. Let's celebrate them. Let's see the danger. And let's work together to 
guarantee a Jewish future in both places. Um, I just asked a question about one thing you said. I mean, like, you know, from, from my perspective, um, like, I would just ask, you know, you, you, you say that so many students see um, Israel as an embarrassing relative, and I agree with half of that statement that I see Israel as a relative, and like, you know, I'm a member of the Jewish people, and Israel is a state of the Jewish people. And, and I wonder, I mean, reading Haaretz, um, and just seeing a lot of the Israeli left in general today, I mean, I wonder if, if I would feel comfortable calling out what is my relative publicly in, in, in an environment where there is so much anti-Israel sentiment already, if on top of all of that, then the Jews start, you, know, you said we should you know, call out Israel in a loud and clear way, if, if on top of what already exists, like how can I, like, like this, the, my thought process, how can I as a Jew join that in embarrassing my family publicly? And I, I, like, I have so much trouble doing that. And I wonder how you think that you know, relates to the canvases you've seen sent to me. So I'll, I'll give you a personal answer. You know, when, when, when my book came out and because it has some troubling chapters describing troubling elements of our history, many people raised that question with me. And, and I understand the question. I mean, you, I, you're, you have a point and those people. In retrospect, what happened is the best service I did for Israel and for the Jewish people was writing these difficult chapters. Because the moment people see that you're sincere, that you're honest, that you're not just giving some sort of cliche, that you're not giving a kind of Hasbara cartoon, they begin to listen to you. I'm such a believer in Israel. I'm, you know, I'm not a great observant Jew, but I'm so passionately Jewish that I believe in us. I believe in our story. I'm not afraid of, of the problems. And I, I think that the overprotective approach has created a situation. So you're obviously, you care so much, but don't take it personally. You belong to a minority. In your generation, you are part of a minority. The large, the vast majority of young American Jews cannot relate to the Israel that you, in the way you do. We have to reach out to these people. You ask me what I see on campuses? The most troubling thing is that in so many campuses, only 10, 20% of the Jews are engaged in any sort of Jewish activity, whatever it be, whether it's APEC, J Street, something religious, something cultural. That's the greatest issue. That's the greatest threat. So young people, and definitely your generation, in my mind, cannot stand indoctrination. People cannot stand censorship and cannot stand narrow cliches. People, you know, even when there are people who don't, definitely people who are so intelligent and informed, but even people who are not that well informed, they smell the, 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 the Hasbara thing. It doesn't work, it just doesn't work. So I think that if we have the more sophisticated approach where we admit that we are no saints, we are no angels, we are definitely not demons, we are humans with a remarkable human story. I think we gave the world so much. We generally were treated so badly by such large parts of humanity. We did such remarkable things while saving ourselves at the last moment. There's a lot to be proud of. So we can address the fact that some things went wrong, some things are wrong, try to fix them. And if we give the more complex story, but with passion and with real love, I think we can overcome these difficulties. So you ask me one, and then I'll ask you two. Uh, given the current government in Israel and the current regime, what are the ways that we as students can um, defend Israel on the campus, considering that the things that we're saying need to be stopped, whether it's the occupation or the um, diminishment of pluralism in Israel, they're not theoretical, they're happening right now, and how can we defend the state of Israel when there's such a difficult regime in place right now? Two things, one is context, and make three things. One is context, I talked about that. Two is making distinction between a specific Israeli government and the state of Israel and the, Jew and the Israeli people. And three, to understand that the only, if you want to end occupation, if you want the two-state to go into two-state, the only way to do it 
is to work with the Israeli majority. If people will just have condemned Israel, demonize Israel, they'll just be sending Israel into the corner and people will close ranks and will not cooperate. If you want Israelis, after all the traumas they went through that I discussed, if you want them to open their heart again and to take the risks, they need, first of all, American leadership and the Jewish community, but America at large, to say to them two things. One, you must change. This is unacceptable. But two, we know how dangerous it is out there. We know it's risky. And we'll be with you. We'll really, you will, we'll really have your back when you do the right thing. If the attitude is a BDS approach, that everything Israeli is, 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 is evil, that is not only wrong morally and absurd intellectually, it's destructive politically. It's, 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 it's the worst service to peace possible. So I, th I think that understanding that is crucial. Talk to Israelis, talk tough sometimes, but, but understand where they are and try to bring about transformation in Israel with this kind of conditional support. Uh, now, I want to ask both of you, I mean, I have, I'll ask each one of you, but how, how difficult is for you with this split within the community that obviously you represent here being each one from the organization that you come from? Is it, is it, does it make your, your, your life really difficult? Um, speaking as the organizer of J Street U here at Harvard, I would say it's been incredibly difficult to have the um, support of our staff, but not of a lot of the students here. Um, and you, you've spoken very eloquently about how important it is for us to uh, conditionally support, or not conditionally support Israel, but speak openly and speak honestly and, and speak up for what's wrong. Um, and what I've seen in our community is sometimes an unwillingness to do that and engage with the harder issues. Um, and there's a sentiment that we don't want to politicize our community, um, but I think what you've alluded to is how politics isn't a bad thing and it's a necessary thing. Um, and so it's been difficult to both love being a part of this community and, and feel like a valued member in some ways, but also feel silenced by other students when it comes to discussing the hardest parts of this conflict. So my, my follow up to that, and it'll be a bit provocative, would be, would you acknowledge the fact that APAC is perhaps an important organization that we need in APAC? I think we should have any political chapters be able to affiliate at Hillel. And Aaron, would you say that J Street is a legitimate organization, perhaps a needed organization? I think J Street as a whole is a legitimate organization, even if I do not agree with many of its points. And I think the opinions represented by J Street and you know, progressive students for Israel is an important voice to have in any Hillel building. So can you both imagine a situation where Howard Kaur and Jeremy Benami sit together like you do and try to develop a new kind of vocabulary that actually talks about what we share and not only what is, is what do we disagree about? Well, I think that that would be ideal, although I also think while we're both on stage right now, that, uh, that doesn't necessarily reflect um, what students here have done. and. Uh, you notice that Aaron said that J Street is a, as a whole, is a national organization. But um, I mean, we can ask straightforward: Do you think that J Street U is a needed voice in this building? I think that the opinions of J Street U are a valuable addition to the community. But I mean, I, I stand by my opinion that I have expressed before that I, I don't see an, a role a role of of an official J Street U, just as there is no official APAC chapter here in Hillel. Um, but I think that the voices that the kids who might be involved in APAC outside of Hillel nonetheless bring into the building as members of the Jewish community just as I see value in the, in the people who are involved with J Street, you bringing their opinions into the Hill community. And as to the Howard Core Jeremy ben -Ami point, I think it might be beneficial. And I mean, from my perspective, I would hope that Howard Core convinces people from Jeremy ben -Ami's audience um, because I mean, I think I, I just I just see danger in Jeremy Jeremy Benami's path of encouraging more um, criticism of Israel when it faces so much. But I already said that. So we, before we open to the floor, would would we all agree that we want a really big tent and with mutual respect and 
always voices respected? I can definitely agree to that. And I, I, I agree in principle, but I, I would, no, as in, wait, wait, as, but I, as in I would throw back to you, mm -hmm. when you say tent of opinions, I'm curious, what do you mean as, you know, within that tent? I mean, do you, do you imagine Students for Justice in Palestine being in that tent? Do you imagine Jews who support BDS being in that tent? Do you imagine, you know, um, hilltop youth being in that tent? Um, so I, I ask you that. I'm talking about anyone who's committed to the legitimacy and, and need to have a strong and prosperous and wonderful Jewish democratic state. Absolutely. Shall we? Yes, please. First of all, thank you for being with us here today. Uh, we actually met two years ago when you spoke to the Israel Trek um, at the time. My name is Gal, and I'm an Israeli student at the college. And I personally know both Rebecca and Aaron, and I'm very happy about the discussions that take place here. But I am more interested in the translation because it's very easy to speak within American Jewry about what is going on in the US. But at the same time, thinking about that being translated, do you think that there's actually a reception within Israeli audience, not only to the American voice at the moment, but particularly considering what's going on in Israel, to some sort of change? You mentioned that we have been committed to peace. As an Israeli, I find it difficult to see that nowadays, as especially so, towards so, pluralism. So, so I, I want to understand what you said. So, so just a bit slower and raise your voice a bit. So, so, so I was wondering the translation step when okay. you're speaking about creating change with an American mindset regarding the conflict or the Israeli state. How do you see that translating in action into what is going on within Israeli politics that are indeed independent as, from what is going on in the U.S. And do you think that Israeli public is even willing to be receptive, or I would like to believe that within itself is willing for such a process at the moment. Um, so uh, perhaps I didn't express myself well. I mean, I, I definitely the you know the the main obligation is with the Israeli public and with the Israeli political system. It's not you know I I, I talked about sentiments and, and phenomena as I see here, but without change in Israel, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. Yeah, and 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 I'll say two things. One that I refer to right now. I'm very critical not only of the extremist Israelis. Many of my friends, like moderate, reasonable, startup nation Israelis, are, don't have enough attention and care about what's going on in the Jewish world. I actually wrote about an article about it last week. For it said there is no the Jewish thing is perceived as kind of unsexy. You know, it's like pension funds. People know it's important, but it's like <laughs> you don't you, you don't get you no know, really. You know, people are much more excited about, about you know, Barifel and, 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 and for some good reasons. But, 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 but it's, it's really, and I'm not joking, it's, it's, it's a deep problem. I, you are amazed because, you know, it's the internet, it's Facebook, it's, it's all this traveling, all this, you know, it's a globalized world. And so many Israelis, even reasonable Israelis, are so much more provincial than we were 30, 40 years ago. Because at that time, we understood that we needed this relationship, and perhaps there were also older connections. You know, Golda Meir could speak Yiddish and crack jokes with Jewish leaders. Today, it's, it's the, so many Israeli politicians and, and Israeli thinkers are, they ignore the Jewish world. And I actually, the article that I mentioned, and, and don't you be offended, but I actually suggested that we'll create an American Jewish APAC in Jerusalem. Because I said, what does APAC do? APAC goes to Congress and it asks every senator and congressman or every president, what did you do today for the American Israeli lives? I want an organization in Jerusalem that will have real power, that will go to every Knesset member and every minister and every prime minister and ask, what have you done today for the American Israeli alliance and for the alliance with our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. I'm saying it, it's, it's, first of all, I think it's a good idea. I happen to like my idea. But, but it comes from a certain element of despair because I don't see the, the, the people are so much, again, you, in, you want to be forgiving to Israelis, the overload of issues, the problems we have, the challenges, the miluim, the taxes, the price of housing, price of living, 
the politics, all that, and the fun as well. I mean, it's so intense there that people don't have the, like, the energy and the attention span. But it's no excuse because it's, 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 it's again, I, I used this verb before, I mean, it's betraying the, the alliance. It's betraying the alliance, not because of people are, are vicious, because they, they live in a closed world. So we need Israelis to understand how li Jewish life in the diaspora, how important it is, and, and we must educate them. And if we cannot educate them in a good way, let's have a kind of powerful lobby that will educate them in a, in a kind of powerful way. That's one issue. The other issue is, of course, the change, the political change, as I said, can only happen in Israel. I think we need support and cooperation with the American administration, with the American Jewish community, but we have to do it ourselves. If we don't wake up and to understand, in many ways, Israel today is a victim of its own success. Because the economic boom is so striking, because of all this high-tech thing, because, because in many ways life is actually, with all the problems, we have a great life between wars. We are ignoring the, the, the existential, the new kind of existential dangers that we face. And, and we must wake up. So I have my political convictions. And basically, I think that the need is to, I said, the problem with Israeli politics, the right, we have a loony right, we have a naive left, and we have a shallow center. And my recipe, so to speak, is to give substance and depth and, and, and ideology to the center. I think that if we bring, I, I mentioned some of the ideas, but I have many on others, but if we bring, if we do the Clintonian thing, if we reform the Israeli center of left the way Bill Clinton reformed the Democratic Party, what Tony Blair did in Britain with New Labour, I think there is hope. I think that people are desperate because they think Israelis became so extremist and ultra-religious and all, I don't accept it. I see reasonable Israelis everywhere. But we didn't deal with the failures of the peace in the past. We didn't address the legitimate fears of Israelis. So many Israelis see the peace elite, so to speak, as detached from reality and detached from Israeli society. It's Israel is like upside down. I mentioned it today to some people. In some ways, the Israeli center left is perceived like Mitt Romney's white Republican Party. So the feeling in so, so many Israelis feel that the left has learned nothing as if the people on the left didn't read newspapers in the last 20 years. The idea is that people are supposed to be progressive and open-minded, have such dogmatic ideas, they didn't change their, their, their ideology, they didn't reform it, they didn't modernize it in 20 years. And at the same time, we, my people like me, are perceived as, as arrogant. So, so the way to have change, first of all, bring the ideas, bring the new ideas, the new kind of ideology, that will reflect two things. One, a new realistic peace concept, and two, a kind of, excuse me, the Hebrew, Avat Israel. I think if rather than just hammer Israel all the time, how many more articles can we write attacking Netanyahu and the settlers and all that? And I'm, you know where I stand. But how long can we go on with this negative ethos? You, 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 you don't save Israel like that. And by now it's becoming boring as well. So I think if we'll take some of that energy to bring, you know, bring back the old kind of labor Zionist constructive ethos, how do you do things, how do you solve things, I think we, we can be surprised. We, we'll, we can wake up one morning after the right kind of elections, after we do the ideology thing and the leadership thing and reach out to our fellow Israelis, I think we, we can wake one morning and, and see a new Israel that is much more promising and then we can deal with all these issues we discussed. Yes, please. Hi, my name's Nadav. I'm a student at Northeastern University. What's your name? Nadav. Um, and it's really great to hear you speak. I think my promised land really changed the way I look at Israel, um, being born in Israel. Um, and my question is, where do you see um, the troubling Mizrahi experience in Israel fitting into this critique and maybe even creating s intersections with people on the left, both Jewish and non-Jewish? Um, well, first of all, it's quite, quite astonishing to see the, the comeback of the, 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 the pain, the, the Mizrahi pain into public life in Israel because 
it was so evident in the 80s and 90s, and then it seemed to subside, and, and now it, it came back in a very angry kind of way. So, so let me give you my, my uh, short version of, of, of Israeli history, I think, what, what I think has happened. I think that early young Israel, Ben-Gurion's first Israeli republic, was wondrous. I think what, what was done in, in, in the country is, is, is astonishing. The way we, a few years after the Holocaust, we lost a third of our people, then we had a terrible war, we lost 1% of our population, then we did what no other nation did. We absorbed the population much larger than the absorbing population. I sometimes say, imagine America absorbing today, going through a horrible war, God forbid, where it loses three and a half million people, and then in three and a half years, absorbing 400 million immigrants while building Senate, a Congress, a White House, a Supreme Court. It's, it's mind-boggling. And you know, when I wrote my book, the surprise for me was how magical the 1950s were. And I knew about the pioneers, the wars, the civilian heroism and wisdom of young Israel of the 50s is mind-boggling. There's a story I mentioned the other day in another university. I'm, I'm now shooting a HBO documentary following my book. So we went to, my father was a scientist in the Weizmann Institute, and we went to the Weizmann Institute to shoot the film. And I walk into the mathematic department of the Weizmann Institute. They have this funny machine in the entrance. I ask, what is this? They tell me, this is Jacek. Jacek is the fourth computer manufactured in the world in 1954 in the Weizmann Institute in Israel. You have a nation of 1.3 million people. Third of the population live in tents and tin huts. We are basically refugees and survivors. People have numbers to tattooed into their arms. People have nightmares at night. We're the ultimate victims of the 20th century. People should have been human wrecks. And within all that, with the wars and the isolation and the poverty and the suffering, we create the fourth computer in the world. It's mind-boggling. The problem is that that great achievement had a terrible price because what went with it was the oppression of individuals and minorities. So the Mizrahim were oppressed, definitely the Palestinians were oppressed, the ultra-Orthodox were oppressed, the modern Orthodox were oppressed. Why do we have the settler movement? Because the Mamlachti Dati, the, the, the Tilumi community, was so oppressed under that old labor Zionism that then they, they asserted themselves in the hills of Judea and Samaria later on. So the Mizrahi pain is part, first of all, is, is, first of all I have no Mizrahi background, but I have a deep sympathy and empathy for whatever reason for that pain. I, I understand the pain that people were not treated properly that people who came who were immigrants, I mean, it was difficult for everybody, but it's true for the, for the Ashkenazi immigrants, they spoke the language, they knew the culture, they had some relatives, it was much easier to, to get along. And no doubt, I don't think, I don't accept the idea that it was like malice, that it was intended racism in a kind of active way, but the outcome was tragic, was painful. During that time, it didn't erupt because people had to struggle. When we w became a bit more safe and prosperous, the pain came out in, in, in erupting in such an astonishing way, first with the Mapach, with, with, with Begin was actually the leader of that, and then with Shas, and, and, and now it's back. So my feeling about it is, first of all, to understand it and to have empathy to that, but on the other hand, not to surrender to that. I mean, not, I think that, that sometimes, and it's not, I have no right to say it because I was not, on, I was not the victim of that, of that phenomenon. And not, my family, I was not around, but you know, my family was, say, on the privileged side. So I have, I have to be, I, the, the, the decision has to be of the people who suffered and their sons and their grandchildren. But I hope we find a way to put it in context. That on one hand, to acknowledge the fact that there was injustice done, specifically to the Mizrahi community. But on the other hand, to see that it was within the context of nation building and, 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 and while doing incredible things, and it was part, this was one of the most successful revolutions of the 20th century. 
And that was part of the price of the revolution. So you have to have to realize it, to acknowledge it. But I hope we will not become, you know, victims of it and not get, you know, addicted to the sense of victimhood. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Zach. I'm a freshman at Brandeis. And my question has to do with Israel's obligation to American Jewry. You spoke about, and on the panel here, there's APAC, there's J Street. What practical steps can Israel take to deepen the Israel conversation within the American Jewish conversation with people that, I don't want to say care and people that don't care, but the committed American Jews, the ones on the right, the ones on the left. What ways can Israel take to show its human side? I think, I think the start is reading your book, but more than that, what to really show that Israel's a human miracle, as you say. What should Israel do? So first of all, it has to really respect American Jews. So actually, I, I said, as, as you understand, I'm not great, exactly a fan of the, the present prime minister and his, and his inspiring government. But, but they did something quite remarkable the other week. I think that the compromise regarding the Wailing Wall was a huge step forward. So the first time, and because it was because they understood, uh, first of all, I think a lot of credit goes to Mr. Sharansky, who led this, uh, but, but Netanyahu is a prime minister, and he should, he, should, he, should, he, he should get the credit, because he understood, not in a kind of active way, but he understood what we were talking about, and, and, and the compromise regarding the Wailing Wall is a good beginning, is a good beginning, because it, 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 it actually acknowledged just the fact that, that reformed Jew, you know, non-Orthodox Jews should have their rights and, and space. In but I think this is really just the beginning. So I, I think that, first of all, I, I think we have to be, you know, I don't expect Israelis to send shekels yet to Boston, you know, to support. But I think we have to understand the issues facing your community and, and be involved. So again, I, I think birthright is wonderful, but it's, we need much more interaction than just 10 days on the bus together. So I think we should come up with all kinds of projects that will bring young, young, American Jews, young Israeli Jews, and young Israeli Jews or non-Jews to be together in all kinds of ways. So I think you have something phenomenal with the, camp, with, with the summer camps here, that Israelis have a, a lot to learn from. Perhaps many Israelis can come here, while some can go there, and we have joint camps. I think that Israel, Israel has to address the problem of having affordable Jewish education here. I think that perhaps we can provide teachers for that. We, we, I want it to be very high on the Israeli, on the agenda of the Israeli government. What are the main issues of the American Jewish community and how can we help as, as brothers? Not, the relationship has to change. It's as important as Israel is, and I think I talked about it all evening, you cannot live in kind of concept that real life is there and you just send checks and you're expected to support. It, a, a healthy relationship doesn't work like that. It needs to be a really a sense of partnership. We help you, you help us. You have no future without us. We don't have a future without you. Let's work on it together. And I think that with that kind of attitude, adding to the fact that we have to deal with the political issue as long as, as we build settlements, it won't work. And really, you know, Ben-Gurion had the sense, the deep sense of we must be a light onto the nations. So this idea that Israel cannot be just about power, just about nationalism. There has to be a sense of mission. I think we need it for our young people, but we definitely need it for your young people. So again, and I'm, I'm a realist. I'm, I'm not a starry-eyed peacenik. There are threats. We have to be strong. Israel must be powerful. We won't be strong. We won't survive for a day. But we cannot be just about power, just about power. The beauty of it, the, the, what we, what the success of the Nine's revolution was that we did not, were not totally consumed by the conflict. By the, this is where I think the Palestinians can learn from us. We, we were in this terrible, tragic conflict. But at the same time, we built a health system that is better than yours. We built housing. We had created a culture. We revived the language. So many publications, so much theater. So that's you know, one of the great Zionist heroes of mine in this day and age is James Snyder, the head of the Israel Museum in, in Jerusalem. That's Zionism. It's not only 
you know, state power and, 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 and bring, combining universal art with our traditions, with the history of the archaeology of the land, that you, you come to the beautiful, renewed Israel Museum and say, this is, this is the, the Teddy Kolek kind of Zionism, that's the Teddy Kolek kind of Jerusalem. How have we lost that? Sometimes you wonder, I mean, we, we, we both lost our sechel in how do we deal with international affairs. And we lost our neshama sometimes in the way we are. We, we cannot be the, the nightmare of the early Zionists that Israel will be like just another Balkan nationalist entity. We, we, we are not about that. We cannot survive like that. We, we, need, we need to fill our soul and we need to inspire others. So bringing back a kind of inspirational Israel is, is crucial. It's crucial. And I think it can be done. Yes, we're going to let two people ask questions consecutively, and then our panelists will get one opportunity to answer both of those questions. Uh, and this will be the last set of questions. Thanks. Yes, please. <laughs> Mr. Shavit, thank you so much for speaking with us I'm tonight. Ari. I'm not Mr. Shavit. Okay, Ari, thank you. Uh, so a few minutes ago, you mentioned this vocabulary that you thought that your generation had maybe failed to impart to us. So my question is, what exactly should that vocabulary have been? And come 10, 20 years, how can we improve that vocabulary for our children? <sighs> oh. So should I answer that or, or to answer them together? What? Together. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, Ari. My name is Dani. Um, I'm actually coming from Brown. Um, so I had the honor of reading your book, and it was really great, like, absolutely eye-opening, I loved it. But there was one part that really bothered me, which was you over and over, you mentioned over and over again the fact that you want this, the secular to grow, like the secular left, and as a religious Jew, I felt very, felt very torn, kind of this, I felt as if it was a little bit antagonistic towards the religious community, and as someone who has lived, spent much time in Israel, has lots of religious friends who believe in peace, has, have people who are in Shayetet and other places it, as soldiers and have contributed much to Israeli society. Um, I was wondering kind of if you could talk a little bit more about that. Oh. Uh, so so I'll, I'll, I'll begin with, with, with this one. I, I'm, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, I wonder if, you know, to go through the book and, you know, to try to give you counterexamples, but, but if that was your impression, that was your impression. But let me tell you about myself, not about the book. I'm, on the one hand, I'm, I'm not non-observant, but unlike many other Israeli chilonim, I'm, I have deep commitment to the Jewish religion and to Jewish heritage. There's nothing anti-religious in me. Uh, I had a wonderful, open-minded, Jewish grandfather who was so Jewish in such a remarkable, beautiful, romantic, emotional way that the Judaism I got from him was so beautiful and inspiring that I don't have any of this kind of you know, anti-religious feeling. And I object many times I get into debates and some, you know, intellectual fights with, with colleagues who, who I, I resent anti-Haredi sentiment and definitely anti-religious anti sentiment. So I'm, you're, I'm totally with you. The issue is, talking of what we talked about today, why do I emphasize non-ultra-Orthodox and sometimes even non-Orthodox Jewry? Because you're okay. You won't have a problem. The problem, the front, is the people who don't have what you have. So I feel, you know, when I go around campuses, I feel like catcher in the rye. I feel that there are so many people there that because of the political alienation and because of the religious thing is unclear, look at the Pew Report, they're losing the connection with our people. They are the ones who are evaporating as Jews. They have a wonderful life. Look, I have, I come from, my family came from Britain. I know the last Jew in my British family. She's a wonderful young woman. I love her. I love her sons. She's the last one. We were hundreds. And it's gone. So some immigrated to Israel. Some came here. But 70, 80% just evaporated. So my role, you, you're okay. You don't need me. You'll be a good Jew anyhow. But my role is to try to front, fight in the front. And I ask the people like you, I have no problems with you, but some 
time people who are in the religious establishment and the political, they are blind to that. And part of the problems in the American Jewish community that many of the organizations are now have people who don't represent the community. Because naturally, the ones who are active are the ones who have a stronger identity, and sometimes they don't understand the dilemmas and the issues and the sentiments of the people we are losing. So, so this is my issue. You know, I've, it's not an antagonistic issue, a, 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 a sentiment whatsoever. On the contrary, I have deep respect for, for what was achieved, what, what, what is there to Jewish life in whatever form. But as long as you respect human rights, justice, equality, and all that, I have issues with, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to accept segregation of women, things like that, but I have no anti-religious sentiment at all. But let us all understand where the battle is. The battle is with the people that, that we are losing. And that leads nicely to, to your question. Look, I, I think I tried the new vocabulary in a sense here, and perhaps I'll write more books about it. But, but let, let me give you like an example that is not vocabulary, but like an idea I believe in, and I think it's a good thing to, 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 to wrap up this evening. I very much to see, want to see, my, my obsession now is to try to see a Jewish Peace Corps. I think that if we manage to create an organization that will be as big and ambitious and wonderful as Birthright, but will be about doing justice in this world, I think we can inspire many young Jews. Now, in my dream, this kind of organization has like five dimensions. I want young American Jews to be able to come to Israel to work with Jews who are unprivileged, talking of the Mizrahi experience, to work in Ofakim and Yerucham and Bechemesh. I want young American Jews to come work in Israel with non-Jews, the Bedouins in the Negev, Arabs in the Galilee. I want young American Jews to be able to go with young Israelis to Cambodia to deal with the poverty and suffering there under the Jewish flag. I want young American Jews to go to the Ukraine to help Jewish communities that are suffering. And I want young American Jews to go to Ferguson, to Baltimore, and to Detroit to do social justice work under the Jewish flag. I think that if we do something like that, we can totally change the positioning of Jewish life, Jewish organization, and of Israel. The tension that we've discussing all evening is that your generation has universal values. Israel, and to a large extent, the Jewish community are perceived as tribal. I'm proud of our tribe. The beauty of our tribe is that it had a universal mission and it has a universal mission. If we translate that concept into action, I think one will be doing the right thing, two will be reaching out to minorities in this country, which is so important to do, and three will prove in action to young Jews that we are, about, we are on the right side of history that we are for justice, we are for human rights, and as Jews, as proud Jews, we are trying to make the world a better place. I think that this kind of attitude can bring a different kind of spirit, vision, and energy to Jewish life, both here and in Israel. Thank you very much.